Over history, pandemics have often led to innovation. A classic example is how Europe's Black Death led to, to a shortage of scribes, and the invention of the printing press followed. Europe changed in myriad ways after that pandemic. Will the current global pandemic spark similar innovation? To inform us about the innovation trends throughout the world, Bruno Lanvin, Distinguished Fellow at INSEAD and co-author of the Global Innovation Index, joins us today to tell us more about the 2021 edition of the report, Tracking Innovation Through the COVID-19 Crisis. Thank you for joining us, Bruno. Hello, Rachel. It was a pleasure to be here. Bruno, how has COVID-19 impacted innovation throughout the world? Has it uh, impacted specific regions in different ways? Well, few areas of human activity have remained immune to the effect, direct or indirect, of the pandemic. It is still too early today to say which of the changes we saw in our economic, social and political behaviors will stay with us in the longer term or be truly disruptive. Yet, over the last two years, innovation has been perceived as a key ingredient of our collective ability to face unprecedented challenges and to build more resilient organizations and societies. The data and analysis mobilized for this edition of the Global Innovation Index indicate that the impact of COVID on innovation has been complex and sometimes surprising. On one hand, the financial resources available for research and development have not diminished, which confirms one of the key messages of previous editions of GII, namely that innovation has a counter-cyclical role to play in modern economies. Faced with the dramatic downturn in economic activity, governments have been quick to break sacrosanct rules of budget balance and to inject massive liquidities and support for failing industries and priority sectors. Innovation also found there strong public support, especially in areas like health and medicine. But private financing for innovation also remained dynamic including from the side of VC. Innovative startups were among the beneficiaries of that trend, especially in fields like health tech and med tech, but also around the tools needed for the development of teleworking and distant interaction among teams and individuals. Spectacular increases in the market capitalization of companies like Zoom or China's e-commerce companies Pinduoduo or Meitan, just to name only two, are clear evidence of this phenomenon. Those developments, however, have been very uneven across the various regions of the world. Large and mature economies have been able to generate the resources necessary because their credit worthiness remained high in international capital markets. In other words, they could bear a sudden increase in public debt. For most of the other economies, COVID contributed to push innovation to the back burner, as large parts of available finance was absorbed by immediate emergencies, especially in the area of public health. For many emerging economies, the sudden drop in key activities such as tourism, commodity exports, or migrant labor has been synonymous with a quasi-total dependence on innovations from abroad, as local innovation could not be financed. Last year, GII had indicated that Latin America as a whole was stagnating with regard to innovation. COVID has actually aggravated that situation in many respects. In Africa, recent victories over poverty and infectious diseases have been partly erased by COVID. How is the GII different this year? Well, this year, GII is being published in a slightly different governance context. INSEAD remains a key player in the production and dissemination of the report, as indicated by the co-editorship of the, this edition of the report, and by the role of GII's academic network. The two institutions constituting GIS frontline, so to speak, are now WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization of the UN System, and Portulan Institute, which is a think tank founded in 2001 by two former members of INSEAD faculty. Beyond this institutional change, GII also innovates this year by including an innovation tracker which summarizes in a visually appealing dashboard some of the key dimensions of innovation, from investment volumes to technical progress to uh, social economic impact. 
We believe that this new component will increase the readability and applicability of the GII, both at the local and at the international levels. Are there any particular innovative breakthroughs this year that mark an entire industry? As I just mentioned, uh, it is still too early to say which COVID-related innovations will have the deepest effect in the longer run. However, the last two years taught us a few important facts. First, we learned that when prioritized, innovation can be accelerated. Even if the help brought by artificial intelligence has been less than sometimes anticipated, e.g. in finding efficient vaccine combination, uh, for, for example, breakthroughs took place that will displace or change entire sectors. Uh, one of the most profound is to be found in the ways in which teleworking and online teamwork have been developing. The economic, social and organizational consequences of two years of real-time experiment are only starting to show. They will not only affect sectors of activities uh, in their entirety, but also the way in which we use space in buildings, for instance, how we organize the cities of the future, how and why we travel, and how we get an education. Accelerated progress made in the production of COVID vaccines, especially in the RNA modification field, may soon translate into the commercial production of similar products to fight HIV AIDS and some forms of cancer. This being said, innovation spending has been very different from one sector to another. While sectors such as ICT, software, and pharmaceuticals have increased spending on R&D in 2020, others such as hospitality, automobile industry have reduced proportionally their R&D investment over the same period. And who leads the GII rankings in 2021? Are there any remarkable changes from last year? Roughly, the world picture remains the same as in previous years. We have Europe and Northern America continuing to lead global innovation, while Asia-Pacific continues to catch up. The rest of the world, in spite of some visible individual successes, continues to lag. This year, we see stability at the top. We still see Switzerland remaining number one, followed by Sweden, the US and the UK, it is quite remarkable that these four economies have been in the GII top five for the last three years. So that's remarkable stability. Among the most remarkable progress at the top of this year's ranking, three are particularly noticeable. Number one, the Republic of Korea joins the top five for the first time, and it does so through a quite spectacular increase. It moved from 10th rank to 5th rank. So something spectacular happened in, in Korea uh, over the, the last 18 months. France, which already was uh, remarkable last year by moving uh, up uh, by 3 ranks, moves again uh, from 12 uh, to 11. So getting very close to the, the top 10. China, similarly, continues its progression. It was 14th last year, and it is now uh, number 12. So just these three examples, Korea, France, and China, shows that even at the top, where things tend to remain a bit more sluggish, uh, things are moving uh, also. In addition to China, a small number of middle-income countries also uh, contribute to changing the uh, landscape uh, globally of innovation. That includes the United Arab Emirates, 33rd this year, Turkey, 41st, Thailand, 43rd, Vietnam, 44th, Russia, 45th, and India, 46th. Uh, we can even add the Philippines, which is almost in the top 50, ranking 51st uh, this year, after a quite spectacular uh, progression over the last few years. Even in regions uh, that still struggle to catch up on innovation, local leaders uh, show encouraging results. For instance, in Latin America, Chile, Mexico, and Costa Rica continue to lead. In sub-Saharan Africa, the performance of South Africa, of Kenya, of Tanzania are encouraging. Rwanda uh, posed the fastest progression among low-income countries. 
The China has continued to rise, but it is still the sole middle-income country in the top 30. How can Turkey, Vietnam, or India, which is up four, for example, break into the top ranks? Is China alone because of its size and determined investment? Clearly, size helps. Uh, that's undeniable. But it is not the only factor. Uh, the example of all the countries you just mentioned show the importance of leadership. Once government authorities decide to consider innovation as a national priority, and many have been encouraged to do so because of the COVID crisis, then something happens. An innovation mindset starts to set in among businesses, among, among investors, among scholars, and the population in general, uh, and then results follow. Last year, we spoke about a pandemic recession. Have countries responded to safeguarding longer-term objectives instead of just considering the current crisis? Well, this is a very uh, crucial question at this point in time. Uh, for the last two years, most of the world has been in reactive mode. Uh, events were happening too fast and were so massive uh, that decision makers had to react on the spot. They could not take the necessary step back to consider the situation as a whole and identify what at INSEAD we would call the, the blue ocean strategies that would allow them to shape their comparative advantages for the next five to ten years. Things had to be done and they had to be done immediately. Yet in the background, the efforts initiated before the pandemic have continued. They have not come to total halt. Uh, efforts made to transform uh, local economies towards more uh, ecologically and socially responsible ones, while taking advantage of the most recent digital tools, have not been slowed down by COVID. Sometimes they have been postponed, sometimes they have been diluted, but globally they have continued. Digital transformation, one could even say, has been accelerated by, by COVID. Uh, what used to be a priority has become an imperative uh, in many, many cases. So uh, that new vital necessity for uh, many firms, large and small, and the sudden drop in all kinds of human activities we can uh, think of uh, because of COVID have accelerated uh, also the effort to transit towards carbon-free economies. So all these uh, fundamental efforts to change our production modes, our societies, have continued. The way in which COVID has uh, affected this trend has been to create a gap between, as I mentioned before, those who have the capacity to mobilize capital, to free themselves from budgetary constraints and smaller economies who didn't have that luxury. Yet overall, the move toward green societies and digital societies, as well as effort to finance long overdue investment in infrastructure, are very much part of the recovery packages. Reassuring uh, as they may be, these recovery uh, packages are mostly present in the more advanced economies. Much remains to be done to reduce inequalities around the world. Um, the, these inequalities, undeniably, have been reinforced by COVID. And I'm not uh, referring only to inequalities in access to vaccines, uh, for instance, and discussions are still going on on how to make uh, available the doses that are needed just to prevent uh, COVID to restart in the third world if uh, we can juggle it in, in the northern part of the uh, hemisphere. Uh, this is a common cause. It needs to be to be addressed. Um, fighting inequalities is an area where innovative thinking, which is broader than innovation, uh, can make a difference. Bruno, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Richard.